Can you hear me? So, so you said technically we have a whole minute before it hits seven oh one. Yeah, I mean, I'm we said we... at my clock. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it, it. I mean, it says seven. I mean, right. we said we were going to start at seven. Yeah. So as long as we start while it's still seven colon zero zero, we're good. Right. Well, okay, okay. The, the, you know, I'm not going to argue you technology. <laughs> yeah, well, that remains to be seen anyway. these days. So we're up to 25 people immediately. Yeah. Hey, Brother Shane Nudrant. Hello, Jamie Marie. Hopefully everybody can hear us. We're kind of ad-libbing here for a what second. What are we doing tonight, Rex? Well, uh, let's, I'll go ahead and display the what topics. What are we doing tonight? Yeah, let me go ahead and show the topics, and then I will. Um, we'll go into our countdown. So tonight, this is... Show 57 is a combination Louisiana Watch, Bozier Watch. And the title of this show is Mobs in the Eiffel Tower. In this case, the mobs are the online Facebook mobs around Ruston, as well as, not really, a, it's not really a mob here in Bozier. I think everybody's concerned about the, the church and political situation here, so it's not really a mob. All right. So let's go ahead and get to a countdown. We've got 42 people on. For the, those of you that are new watching the show, here's the way this works. I'm going to do about a two and a half minute countdown timer. That gives you time to go grab something to drink, like a nice glass of sweet tea, or there it is right there, uh, or whatever you prefer to drink, a bag of popcorn or whatever. Tag, text some friends, tell them we're back online, and we've got a few things to discuss tonight. We will be back in about two and a half minutes so just stay right there. Well, hello again, Mr. Lowry. Boy, you, you got me all kind of uh, uh, bum-fuzzled with all that first church drama update, Cedar Creek School, all these things flying across the screen. Boy, technology is going wild up in here tonight. Well, you know, we are trying to improve our little amateur 
journal, citizen journalism thing here. So I thought, you know what, we should actually list the main topics that we're going to talk about tonight. And that way people can kind of see and keep up as we go. And I'll do my best effort to kind of check them off or make them disappear as we cover a topic or I don't know. Anyway, we're going to wing it tonight like we always do. Now, you said amateur. I like to think of us as high-achieving regular people. <laughs> achieving we, regular. Do we have to be amateurs? Can we, yeah, can we that, be just high-achieving regular people? Well, I guess that's a good term. Uh, we're achieving pretty good tonight. We're already at 83 folks watching. Hello to everybody, especially those of you that are new. And I guess as, since we're such high-achieving regular folks, we need to explain why we have two logos and, you know, we have two Facebook pages broadcasting this out. So we're going through an identity crisis again that some of you may remember from a few months ago, but not really. I've decided, and, you know, you and I discussed it. So on Tuesday nights will be Bozier Watch, which is primarily going to be just Bozier, Bozier Parish, you know, really local uh, stuff. And then Thursday nights is going to be Louisiana Watch slash Bozier Watch, hence both logos and the color scheme and all that. And we're going to talk more about some Bozier stuff, regional and even statewide, maybe even a little national stuff. Well, I think you just about covered it. So jumping right off into it, Rex, you know, before we jump off into First Church and before we jump off into Cedar Creek, which, you know, you've been following that pretty hot and heavy, but did you realize that tomorrow is the big day? Tomorrow is the big day. Which big day would that be? Because apparently I am out of the loop. Well, tomorrow, the Arizona audit, the forensic audit. I mean, uh, well, you've been living under a rock. I mean, apparently so. You know how the I am. forensic audit. Uh, all the fraudulent votes of 2020, all, it's all going to be poured out tomorrow, live, 1 p.m. in the Arizona Senate chambers. Hmm. Well, that's going <laughs> to be they're interesting. Gonna, they're going to reveal it all. Have they actually come up with some, you know, new findings, new information? So here's what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is, is that, you know, as well as there being ballots that, you know, were had paper made in China that wasn't printed in the United States, all that stuff. You remember hearing all that, right? Right, sure. Well, supposedly in the last couple of weeks, somebody from Arizona out there has been running a comparison of social security numbers to registered voters or voters that were on the, the voter rolls during that time. And if, if I read the story correctly, there's something to the tune of half a million people that don't uh, register in the social security system. They're not real people. Hmm. Well, that's a, you know, half a million is not an insignificant number. I mean, you know, it's not like 500 people that you could say was a human error and an oops. Uh, that's, you know, that's pretty substantial. Jamie Marie Pope, mm -hmm. you know, our friend from South Louisiana that keeps right. us informed on some of the things is advising that her stream keeps messing up and it keeps repeating what we're saying over and over. And I mean, it's like, we're making sure you day for her. Well, we're making so sure she gets might... the point. Go ahead. <laughs> Maybe some people have to have it said to them more than once, right? All right. <laughs> she she can appreciate that. It's a joke. Yeah. So I'm double checking uh, on the text. Uh, Duke, you are la and I just sent you a text. You are lagging a little bit, so it may be the connection on your end. So you know. I'm fine because if I say something, I'll just give it a second or two for it to pick up on your end. But if it gets too bad, just, you know, sign out, reboot, whatever, and I'll ad lib till you come back if necessary. Sounds like a plan. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, kind of review anyway, the rest of that. I'm going to be double checking. Audit. Tomorrow, the Arizona audit, that's the big day. The Arizona audit's going to hit, and we're all going to know, you know, for the only state that had the guts to actually do a 
forensic audit, you know, actually scanning the ballots to make sure it was legitimately paper that was actually mailed to verify if it was actually paper that was printed here in the United States to verify if actually a human, you know, signed the, the, the vote and, and sent it in, or was it a computer thing? Or was it even a ballot that was stuffed? You remember that, Rex? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we know some people who actually stuffed a ballot. Yeah, we know uh, somebody that did it live on Facebook. That... Live on Facebook. You, you know, for y'all watching, did you know that it is a real thing that you can legitimately take a fake ballot? You can stuff a ballot. You can take a mail ballot. And in fact, they even did it here in Louisiana, as I understand. Yeah, uh, did it right in Louisiana from a top secret chamber. And, uh, you know, that was a few shows back. I don't know, six, seven, eight months ago, maybe. You know, we're on, what is it, show 57 now, plus a few other Louisiana Watch shows. So we're like over 60 shows so far now. Yeah, it might have been at the beach. I don't know. Somebody, somebody at the beach. But, and... So moving along, and I'm not sure on this lag, but you'll just have to bob your head up and down and I'll get the me message about a minute later, maybe. And if y'all are watching, again, if you see issues, please text us or, or message in the that. But did you see, Rex, the Public Service Commission had a meeting on some serious issues they were trying to address today. And, uh, you know, they uh, actually put on a show. Well, I heard that they were offering a, a very interesting public service to everybody that was in on that Zoom call. Uh, sounds like they were doing a little advertising for Pornhub or somebody. Now, now was it the public service commissioners or was it maybe somebody that, you know, was trying to make fun of the fact that no, elections can't be hacked. No way, right? <laughs> well, I think it's a little easier than that because I think they have those Zoom meetings pretty open. And so there are folks out there that, you know, look for open meetings that they can just join in and push content in, you know. And you say, well, how do they, why do they do that? Well, they do it for money because if they only get, think of it this way, if they're, millions of Zoom meetings going on in a given 24-hour period, even if they only get a tenth of a percent of a hit rate of people clicking off onto what they're presenting, they're making money. So, you know, there's a legitimate tech reason for that, not the fact that I really think the Service Commission was pushing the porn industry. Yeah, no, that wasn't the case at all. And actually, Jamie Marie Pope, I mean, if you click the link, I mean, there there is a uh, a link that we could put up there and we could share. And, and kudos to Jamie Marie. She uh, stays on top of uh, things legislatively, um, including the Public Service Commission down there. Um, she was on top of the meeting and uh, caught this. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so give me a second here, and I'll go ahead and put that uh, link up there. And, yeah, Jamie Marie has been a, a good friend of the show, uh, so to speak. Now let me see if I can get this up there just a second. There we go. And I'll try to get this sized over here so it looks nice. Well, maybe not. Uh, there we go. Okay, so let me get this over there. So here we go. Uh, Louisiana Public Service Commission Zoom meeting is disrupted by hackers throwing up porn videos while commissioners attempt to discuss regulatory issues involving utilities. Meeting briefly adjourned so PSC staffers can reset the system. And it's my understanding that they didn't have any issues after they reset the meeting or whatever. I, honestly, I don't use Zoom that much, so I'm not like a Zoom wizard. Yeah, and, and, and the reason I wanted to point this out was primarily, and Jamie Marie Pope was like honing in on it, you know, like a missile. I mean, she hit the point. I mean, so if you've got these official government meetings and they're conducting it by computer and electronic, yeah, I'm going after your base there, Rex, the technology and the computer stuff. I mean, if you can 
zoom in on a Zoom meeting and crash it and disrupt it the way this was. I mean, why should anybody believe that your elections with electronic voting machines should be any different? Well, let me just let me give you a good reason, because this is basically an open meeting. It's not like they had any real authentication to come into this meeting. They have to have it open to allow the public in, just like a public meeting, a a normal public meeting. And again, as a former member of the Board of Election Supervisors, not that that's any, you know, huge deal, but I got a lot more versed in the election systems in Louisiana here. And while nothing's ever 100% secure, I can tell you that right now, even with the older technology that they use in Louisiana, it is relatively secure. Let me just put it that way. So that's why. Well, I could make multiple arguments, but I'm not going to make multiple arguments because that isn't going to be the focus of our show tonight. We can have that <laughs> debate and argument in live TV for all to see in another show, and no. you'll you'll get to see you. Rex and I go at it. He'll go at it from a technology standpoint, and I'll go at it from a guy who, let's just say, is going to play the devil's advocate and mm-hmm. try to cheat the system and how I would do it. Right. So with that being said about election, you know, integrity and all that stuff, mm-hmm. guess who's coming to town next week? Santa Claus. <laughs> no, it's a little early for that. And okay. No, it's not Brad Jerkman. It's oh, not he, Brad. yeah, he's already here, and he's not leaving till the second coming of Christ. We'll talk about that again here shortly, folks. But no, Mister Election, Kyle Ardwan, he's going to make an appearance at the Republican Women of Bozier. Really? Oh, so um, is there an election coming up soon? Is he running for re-election as Secretary of State, or what's the well, purpose of said meeting? I think he's just trying to get around the state and trying to, you know, warm everybody up that, hey, you ain't got to worry about nothing in Louisiana. We're all good. There ain't no way somebody could like you that could figure out a way to cheat the system or stuff about it. You can't do those kinds of things. Not in Louisiana. No way. It just can't happen. Right. I think you just got to build up confidence in everybody. Well, like I said earlier, relatively secure, and there's no way to get it 100% secure. So if he thinks that there's no way to do it, (laughs) we need another Secretary of State. Well, you know, ironically, Rex, so you do know he is the president. You know, there's a Secretary of State's Association. Did you know that? Uh, I had heard of that, but tell me a little little bit more about it. You, You know, like, the Katie Hobbs secretary of state in Arizona that said, you know, Hey, the Arizona election is like 100% above board. The secretary of state of Michigan, you know, what is our, is that Jocelyn Benson? Maybe, you know, the secretary of state of Georgia, Raffensperger, you know, they, I mean, it's all one big confab they had back this summer, big powwow. And guess who they all elected to be the chairman or president of, the National Association of Secretaries of State. Let me guess. Uh, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle Ardwan. Yeah. How about that? Well, there were some interesting things that came out of that meeting. So, you know, that happened back uh, earlier in the summer. And mm-hmm. Rex, as you know, our viewers may not know, we have been trying to pin Kyle Ardwan down to ask some specific questions Mm -hmm. all year long, ever since SB 221 back in the Senate, whenever that was going on, you know, election integrity bills. Right. We we were, we had been pushing hard and you realize to this day, we still have not gotten him pinned down and he hadn't answered a question from us yet. He's a slippery rascal, isn't he? I, I, I just don't understand that, but, the people that are watching will be happy to know that we plan to attend the Republican women of Bossier on Tuesday, next Tuesday. Mm-hmm. And he's not going to get to bypass those tough questions this time. Now, wait a minute. Are you sure that uh, they're going to, because I heard that the questions had to be submitted beforehand. So it sounds to me like, you know, there's going to, it's going to be a softball game, not 
a baseball game. So are you sure that he might get some tough questions, or is this going to be easy peasy, slow softball? And I don't have anything against well, softball, folks. I, it's a great sport. I, 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 you know, I don't know. I know that there was an attempt to try to vet mm -hmm. questions, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I'm trying to determine whether that was him or where that came from. But what I do know is, is that I'm planning to go there and mm -hmm. I'm planning to ask the man tough questions specifically, you know, about election integrity, audits of the vote, you know, not just the general definition of an audit. I mean, you know, what we're talking about is forensic audit. You know, in Pennsylvania, for example, you've got, you know, the the president of the Senate up there, you know, took over from Senator Mastriano, took over their uh, potential audit. You know, he said in one statement he was going to do a forensic audit, and then now it's turned into a audit. And that's not something that's actually going to look at the detail, you know, that, and that's where they kind of whip all of us. The regular folks like us is they, they, they split words and, and they don't really go to the fine print, the things that could affect an election. They don't want to look at all of them. They want to tell you the general public that, Hey, yeah, we did an audit. It's all good. And for you, just the, since you hear the word audit, that's good enough but it really isn't getting down to the detail of what you think an audit is. So uh, I, I had mentioned the Cypress District in several shows, actually, which is crazy. Uh, but it's kind of like, you know, when the Cypress District said they've had an audit performed. Well, they have, but, you know, and I'm no CPA or anything like that, but it's it's kind of a... I hate to use the word surface audit or, or whatever, but it's not a deep dive into everything. It's more on the procedure side and verifying numbers and, and things like that. And those are published uh, with the Legislative Auditor's Office so they can be reviewed at any time. So anyway, you're right. So yeah. when they say audit, you think that's, oh, well, yeah, they went over every every little mark and every little detail, but that's not necessarily true. Now, speaking of audits, you know, I hear the audits at First Bossier is a subject of discussion. Yes, it is. So uh, shall we go ahead and dive off into First Church, as you call it? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think we should. I mean, uh, since, uh, you know, the last show has been a lot of feedback. Right. Um, you know, a lot of folks said that they thought that we were fair and balanced on it. And uh, yeah. I, I think we were. I mean, we weren't. I don't know that we were headhunting. If anybody thinks we were, I'd love to hear if they thought we were headhunting. Yeah, well, maybe we were. I well, mean, slightly. We trying to point out. Go ahead. Well, it's like we said on Tuesday night show, which happened to be one of our, actually probably at this point, most popular shows so far. Uh, but like we said then, what we reveal about First Bossier and the church and the things going on there is not directed at the entire congregation. It's directed at some of the things that are going on administratively and otherwise uh, and that involve politics, which is where we come in. You know, why it really interests us is the political angle of it. And so it's not to try to, you know, destroy the church or take down the church, even though Brad says that Sunday in his sermon, which we're fixing to play the audio of some of it here in a few minutes. Uh, it, it's not that at all. It's to point these things out and let the church membership itself decide on if they need to proceed, how they need to proceed, what they need to do, because there are some things going on at that church, like at many churches, that, I don't know, they just don't quite pass a smell test. Yeah, and again, like the, the last word I said before you started talking was light, you know, and shine, shining the light on the subject matter, shining a light on the issues. And of course, again, what you said was, was our focus is the politics of things. And right. you of I, you and I have looked at the politics for a long time. We've seen it. I remember you and I years ago having a discussion, even before we even dreamed about Bozier Watch or Louisiana Watch, before we even, even, even considered this show, we were talking about the politics of the first church right. and how it was a tool. I mean, we had those conversations 
Yeah, and honestly, you you were one of the first people that kind of opened my eyes to what was going on because, I, you know, I hate to say it, uh, both of us had kind of drank the proverbial Kool-Aid about so, political folks around here, and then all of a sudden there was this eye-opening, awakening experience type of thing, and, and, you know, it is what it is. And so we kind of spelled some of that out um, last week. I think we're going to spell a little bit more of it out this week. But just so everybody knows, um, apparently Sunday, which I think was the 19th, the sermon or message from Pastor Brad was either not streamed and broadcast as normal or was cut off and pulled down, whatever the scenario was. You know, I'm not a member of First Bozier. But we do have a copy of the audio, or at least the vast majority of the audio from that message, and we're going to highlight some of that. As a matter of fact, I'm having it transcribed, but I don't have that ready yet, but we'll play the audio. And I'm going to hit some highlights. I'm not selectively editing this, you know, to try to... Um, try to be malicious towards the church. I, I'm going to pick out some points in it that have context and relevance and point out some things. And once we get the transcription done, we're going to post the entire audio file as a video with the transcription in the video. And that way folks who might have missed that message and sermon can be able to hear it. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and, Rex, I do know that we're going to cover the Cedar Creek school incident yes. or issue. And so if there's folks watching that, you know, as soon as we get through with the first church issue, we're going to jump right over to the Cedar Creek issue. And if you're not familiar with the Cedar Creek issue, you might want to watch this because this is a pretty amazing story coming out of Ruston over here. And uh, yeah. we'll see how it pans out. But now, in the notes I see, Rex, and you added this portion of the note about the letter that we shared um, from the Baptist blogger. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, elaborate on that a little bit. Well, okay. So there was a, a basically a letter to Brad, uh, or a letter to the pastor, that was posted on the Baptist blogger website and was shared around on social media. I actually do know who wrote the letter, but I don't, I don't have the okay to share the name yet, and so I'm not going to share that yet um, this evening. Uh, folks, y'all probably, especially if you go to First Bowser, you probably know who it was, but I don't want to share it out just yet unless this particular person's comfortable with it. But anyway, so we did share that now, letter. Go ahead. Now, was that, that the four-page letter? Uh, I believe it was. As a matter of fact, give me a second, and I'll, I can actually pull that up from the previous show notes. Let me look here and see. Well, you know, because because actually we were trying to bring that letter up in the in the last show and the four because we were specifically looking for the fourth page and the part we were looking for was at the top of the fourth page. Yeah, and I can bring and, that and, back up. Let me verify kinda, it here. Yeah, yeah. we kind of missed it. Right. All right. Let me do that right now. So this is all right. I'm going to bring up the first page of the letter. Okay. So this is the first page. I did the yellow highlighting in, in this copy of it. And, and notice there, it, it doesn't say, you know, Dear Brad or whatever, but this is who it was addressed to. Um, and it starts out, as you know, we have been encouraged not to associate, be seen with, or communicate with people that you do not like or, or approve of. This is a letter from a staff member or a member of the church that's actually involved in, in the ministry part of the church writing a letter, apparently, to Brad Jerkovich, the pastor there. So this isn't like we're just making this stuff up. This, the information we're getting is coming directly from church members, who are many of which are still members. And so this is page one of that letter, if you're wondering which one that we're referencing. And we talked about it a little more last Tuesday show, show 56, so you can go back and see that. Duke, I'm going to bring up page four now, because you're right, that's you know where... That's where the uh, verse was that we were looking for, which is Ephesians 5.11, right there at the top. You know, now I'm, I'm going to, I mean, we're going to kind of go off notes here a minute, and I'm going to go back in time to our personal conversations, Rex, that you and I had. I mean, good gracious, how many years ago was this? Six, seven, eight, nine years ago, yeah. you and I had this conversation. You're, and you remember this, that we were talking about, you know, 
churches, this was our personal conversation. Churches shouldn't be building a church to make it like a castle and a fortress to keep people out. And yeah. do you remember us talking about that? We felt like that was what first Bozier was doing. They were building a castle to defend from people being able to come in it. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and the reason you build a castle is for protection of the citizens, so to speak, but it's to keep your enemies out. And that, Seemed that as I was looking in from the outside and and kind of being relatively new to Bozier politics at that point, because you know I didn't grow up here. I grew up half my life in Monroe. Well, part of it in Haynesville, part of it in Monroe, majority of it in Ruston. So I was relatively new to Bozier politics back then. And when you started looking at what was going on, it was obvious to a lot of us, even if it might not have been to a lot of the members. And that's part of the reason that we're diving into this. And I want to say hello to Sarah Culverhouse Stevenson, says she's watching from Northwest Arkansas, former Bozier resident. Glad to have you and everybody else watching. Okay, Duke. So, yeah, so we know that there were issues that, that have been going on there, and we discussed this timeline about this and kind of uh, how it was happening, and I'm jumping off notes just a little bit, but so do you want to walk through what you and I discussed earlier or yesterday as far as kind of the general timeline of how things happen? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know that we need to go that far right. in rehashing all of that. I think everybody really knows the timelines, but I, I think maybe we dispense with this fourth page that you pulled up because we really didn't get to go through this four page document on right. the last show. We, we wanted to, but we really didn't and right. point out the high points and you've got some more things highlighted there. And then when you go ahead and point out the four things, the things that you already have highlighted, but there's one more thing on there that I want to, when you get done okay. uh, addressing those things. Yeah. So I'll hit the highlights there. Um, and you can see in yellow well highlighted again this is from a church member and and staffer uh who apparently to brad jarkovich says we have slandered and viciously attacked people who do not agree with the perspective of our leadership um because when this person came seven years ago there were 2300 seats and it was hard to find a place to sit now we're excited to see 500. some of that might could be blamed on covid but not really um Anyway, uh, how many of those 500 are crying out to God to rescue them and expose the darkness within the halls? And then second highlight down there on number eight, dozens of former staff members of First Bossier are in church trauma counseling. Think about that. Uh, I mean, look, I, I, I could start rattling off some names of some people who literally have had their families split up directly from first Bozier. And again, I'm not saying from the general congregation, but you all know exactly what I'm talking about. Those of you that attend there or have attended in the past. And so I know that what's being revealed in this letter definitely has an element of truth. Without a doubt. And the point the the in last show, this was the part that I wanted you to highlight. And don't scroll too far forward, or you're gonna. Right, gotcha. and whoever wrote this letter was on the mark. But but right up there, the scripture that they quote, Ephesians five eleven. You know, I I think that is the nuts and bolts of this thing. I think it really is. I think as people come to the conclusion that you know maybe they've been a part of something unknowingly. I think they're starting to conclude that they were. And, you know, for our standpoint, I appreciate that because I think that's what we're doing. You know, you and I joke about the black van pulling up at the end of our street because we talk about these subjects and the subjects that people won't openly talk about. We Well, and we do it. We dive out there with no, with no, regard i guess you could say and we talk about these subjects this one here when we did that last show we didn't know whether or not we were going to be condemned for doing it or whether or not you know we were going to be praised for doing it yeah i mean and, it, it could have gone either way and i, I want to point out taylor davis had a comment said also on the first page so page one of this letter uh, and i just put it up there for just a few minutes uh, the sexual harassment that was reported and nothing was done. Again, that goes right back to Ephesians 5.11. T 
Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're, we're not exposing anything that a lot of first, uh, first Bossier folks don't already know. But we have been asked to look into this by multiple people who attend First Bossier. Not people who have some beef or whatever, by folks who currently attend and former members. And, and, and this is kind of getting off of First Church. But that is, Rex, that is why we started this show. That is right. why we started to to do this. And, and we weren't the original folks that started this out. Jim right. Wells with My yes. Dozier. Yeah. Jim Wells, you know, God bless him. I mean, he, he he's in heaven and uh, he's looking down. Hopefully he's happy that somebody's carrying on the tradition. But there needs to be someone that steps up and you know, sp speaks about these things. Somebody has to do it and open the discussion and open the dialogue. Well, it, you know, they can keep, or, or whether it's First Bossier or any other organization or entity, they can keep trying to sweep these things under the rug, but eventually somebody's going to trip over the rug. And when they trip over the rug, they're going to look under the rug, and then all this stuff goes flying everywhere. And and that's pretty much what's happening here. I want to point out this comment, and Matt, thanks for the comment about us doing great. Hey, we're trying. Um, Grady Davis says, keep in mind that this program is interested in politics. True. The trifecta at first, Bozier, Brad, Eddie, Lorian have tried and succeeded in nudging into politics over the past years. Yeah, Grady, as we pointed out, they've done probably more than nudge in. Um, Elizabeth Palmer says the trifecta needs to leave. It's not for us to decide that as far as Duke and I. We're just here to kind of put it out there. Uh, but we appreciate all the commentary, even if you don't agree with us. So, um, and I want to read this number. Well, we talked about Jeff, Jeff Luce some and, and what happened to him last Tuesday. Number 10 here says, if we are to evaluate the patterns of our church, we will see that what was once approximately 2,300 in worship has dwindled down to 500. There was a split in our church at least three times. And here's the thing. This is a pattern for the pastor. This is not the first time this has happened. I mean, wow. church, church splits are not uncommon, but generally you don't see three in a short span of time like this. That indicates an underlying issue, especially when the pastor has his previous ordeals in Lubbock. You can look them up. Um Follow this same pattern. Anyway, it says the reputation of our church has been drugged through the mud. We are known for injuring people, slandering people, and attacking people. It's not what the church should be known for, and that's what non-believers and and you know uh, the left uh, use to attack Christianity and modern churches. That that's exactly what they say happens in a church, and we all know that that's not true in every church, but. It certainly is, at least in some of them. And so, anyway, that's why we're bringing this out. All right. So, moving forward. Um, so, I was, I'm, I'm trying to copy a link that I had sent to you days mm -hmm. ago of, that someone had sent to me to uh, be able to pull up there real quick. But I, I guess the Facebook gods don't want it to happen. But mm. so, We've been getting reports, Rex, mm -hmm. that, you know, the pastor at First Bozier, he has been racing, for some reason, he's been racing to remove and replace all of the existing deacons. Really? Did you know that? I had heard that rumor. Do we know if, if he's been successful in that? And, and why, with this timing, would he be attempting to do that? Well... I don't know that he's done it. I, I don't know. I mean, that's just what we are told. And, you know, but he's racing to replace them with other deacons who are supportive of him, I understand. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because in his message uh, that we're going to play from uh, Sunday, there is a quote in there. He kind of sort of addresses that. He doesn't talk about replacing the deacons, but he does mention... Um, the fact that they did a new uh, set of church bylaws and that those bylaws weren't available to the general congregation before he got there, apparently throwing a little shade there at um, 
uh, Pastor Lowry. Uh, so I, that plays right into him attempting to replace the deacons. Um, is he able to do that? Do we have any confirmation on what the bylaws actually allow him to do or not do? Well, yesterday, so, you know, we did our show on Tuesday. Then Wednesday, as you know, I mean, we got a report that the deacons, the existing deacons, and I don't even know who they are. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, I probably know a few of them, but I don't, I really, I don't have a clue as to who any of them are, but we did get a report that the deacons had called a meeting and they were meeting actually yesterday. Now we've got no report. You may have Rex, but to my knowledge, you hadn't. You I mean, usually you, we, me and you stay on top of uh, each other's reports, but I mean, to my knowledge, nothing, we don't know of anything that's come out of that meeting or what conclusions they came to, what decisions, if any, or, or, or what transpired. I mean, we don't know yet. That's still to be uh, determined. But um, well, let me put a comment think, up here. Um, Christy Schultz said it goes back to no audit conducted at all. Let me move that where we can kind of read it here. Um, also says, yes, he can fire anyone. Uh, and then Kayla Davis says, I believe he has removed a couple of deacons from what I've heard. So again, we're trying to kind of confirm that um, and just see what's going on. But Duke, you want to go ahead and let's jump into the audio file? Well, you know, that's what we understand. Right. And right before we jump off into the audio, you know, we understand that even if the deacons, let's say the deacons came to the conclusion that they wanted to remove the pastor and they wanted to change direction or do anything. Doesn't matter if that's what they want or not. Right. It's not, doesn't matter if that's the conclusion that they came to. Right. Because supposedly as the story goes, is that at some point, the bylaws of the church was changed to such that the pastor could basically send all the deacons to the curb at, at any time that he wanted to, at the snap of a finger. Well, uh, now, according to Brad, and again, it's, it's in the audio file, uh, according to Brad, that, you know, those bylaws were able to be read by any church member. Um, so, you know, maybe it's kind of... Uh, Kind of like a lot of things that people read, they don't necessarily pay attention to the fine print. I want to put this comment up here from Eric Falting. He says, did whoever was responsible for hiring him, Fred Lowry, a group of members, etc., not do extensive background research on this pastor, call the previous churches, search news articles, etc.? All right, so Eric, I can address that directly. So I got a phone call from a former First Bossier member who was on that board or committee uh, when they were searching for the replacement pastor, and Brad was not the only one. I, if I remember right, there were like seven, maybe more than that. Uh, but anyway, according to this former church member, they did do an extensive background check. Uh, Jerkovic came highly recommended. Um, he did, you know, they asked him about the, the former church situation in Lubbock, and he did address some of that. And at that point, because he was so highly recommended, the committee felt that, it was, you know, it was going to still be okay to move forward uh, with him. And, you know, I forget how many people were on that board. Um, so the answer is yes, Eric, there was a committee and board that did do some vetting. Miss Ann Price says in the old days, the deacons uh, ran the church, not the pastor. And Miss Ann, that's still the case with some churches uh, today, but a lot of times they'll change their bylaws to do basically what Brad's done as well. You know, but Rex, what I'm told is that there's been a concerted effort to change the bylaws of numerous Southern Baptist churches to where it's no longer deacon-led, it's pastor-led. And in fact, I think that's the terminology that's being used. Yeah, and honestly... Um, I don't necessarily agree with that movement. Uh, it can go either way. 
you know, you can get a, a, a group of folks in there that for whatever reason have a beef with the pastor or whatever, and, you know, they can take him out. Um, on the flip side, you can have a situation like it's going on here where all of a sudden you get a pastor in and, and you can't get him out. You know, or it's not up to the congregation and the church is made up of the congregation. You know, the pastor is not an idol well, to be worshipped. Well, the pastor is not a you, prophet. Do you, do you think... I'm curious. Do you think that the majority of people in churches, and I'm not just talking about first church, I'm talking about every church. Do you think that the majority of people believe that a church should be uh, led and, 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 and accountable by the majority? I mean, all of the people of the church and, and say the group of deacons, or do you think that people believe that it should be totally accountable by the pastor, by one person. One person should make all the decisions, but there should be no check and balance. I mean, what what is it that makes people, I'm going to go and answer the question. I think the majority of people all have this ideology that, you know what, there should be this check and balance. You know, you have deacons. It's kind of like the pastor is the president. It's kind of like the deacons are the legislator. And, you know, right. all the members of the church are all of the voters. So you have this measure of accountability. Maybe it's the way our structure of our society is, is that that's the way we all like it. And maybe we're going in the wrong direction. Well, maybe that's why everybody's opposed to it. Maybe so. But, of course, the flip side to that is, you know, each each church is different each congregation is different i mean the goal is the same you know uh the core goal is to get people in there to hear the word but that's why we have so many different denominations different churches and look this is not just a big church thing either i've been involved with some small churches very similar situations we've had some commentary on that uh as well from other folks too uh so you know it i it is what it is um and I'm trying to get that link pulled up that you just sent me. So let me see if I can find it here. Uh, so anyway, well, all we right. can pull that up, up after after we go through the uh, after we go through the uh, Sunday service that we right. we've got. You know, yeah. And somebody just somebody just texted me and said, you know, the uh, Southern Baptist uh, Church Association or what have you. Paige Patterson, you know, that Brad was real tight with Paige Patterson, whoever that mm -hmm. was, and that, uh, you know, Paige is now disgraced and is uh, toxic to the Southern, Southern Baptist, mm. I'm assuming, convention church. Yeah, so, all right, so, uh, folks, as we get into uh, showing or hearing some of the, the message from Sunday, we're, go ahead and comment for us if you don't mind, were any of you present? at the first Bozier service this past Sunday to actually hear this message. We had reports that his message was only 10 minutes. Well, that's not true. There's like 28 minutes of audio that I've got. So, you know, and I've listened to actually all of it now. Uh, but anyway, so let's kind of jump over to that. And for those of you here for uh, uh, the Cedar Creek information, we will be getting to that here in probably about 10 minutes or so. So you all stay tuned. Let your friends know in about 10 minutes we'll be talking about that as we get through the first Bozier situation. Um, all right, anyway, here we go. So let me let me cue this video up here. All right, so I'm going to pause it right here. So this is this is the first Bozier service, uh, apparently Sunday, September the 19th. And I'm kind of calling it the missing sermon because apparently they either stopped their streaming or pulled it down. This audio was recorded by somebody that was there and sent to us. Uh, so I'm going to jump us up to about the five minute mark here and we'll kind of start there. Um, well, let's see here. Let me get us a little bit closer. All right, here we go. So uh, let me bring the volume up. All right, here we go, folks. So a few months ago, I was presented with a letter of concern from some of our church members back in June. This letter was given to me. Um, about 11 men were signed on it. 
included some guys who were connected with leaders and deacons and some other men who I've always considered brothers of Christ. And you know, I will say, any kind of pastor, uh, let me say this. When I first got here, there were some choppy waters. You know, any kind of transition, there's always challenges. And Leroy Faith, who's been here a while, he would come to my office and he'd bring somebody. He'd say, hey, pastor, so-and-so has some questions or concerns about something. So I just brought them here to hear from you directly. And he did that four or five, six times, maybe. And it was very, very healthy. It was very, very helpful. And I was grateful for that. But any pastor would tell you, any time you get a letter that's signed by people that you go, okay, you know, I'll let these guys know where coming from. What's the angle here? And then you read the letter and you go, well, man, that's not true. I don't know where they're coming from. Did you hear what he said? What's the angle here? I heard that. Yeah, uh, and it's a little hard to hear again. I, it was, I, I boosted the audio a little bit again. I've got a transcription being made of it or whatever. So I want to play that part of it to confirm that he was presented with a letter, a signed letter. I don't know if it was the same letter that you know we showed just a few minutes ago or which specific letter it was. In the audio, he doesn't ever clarify that. But if it was a different letter, well, that just opens up another can of worms because that means that there's, you know, this isn't just a vendetta by one person or a small group of people, that there is something going on here. And and did I hear correctly, he said, I a couple of months ago? And then yes. did I hear June? Yes, that's what I heard. Again, once the transcription's done, we'll be able to verify this. Yeah, in June. All right. So Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Now, we've got a couple of comments here that uh, uh, Elizabeth Palmer, uh, Elizabeth, I guess it's Goulet Palmer, says, I attended. They also deleted all comments um, from the live stream, and apparently the feed was stopped, and the whole live has been deleted. I mean, they could have just turned off comments and left the message up there, but apparently they wanted to pull down. Okay. So let me get us up to about the 10 minute mark here. Um, actually, it'll be in about 14 seconds. This is where Brad's talking about prior to him, there was no budget vote in years, no opportunity to view financials. Uh, the congregation, the church members hadn't seen a constitution or bylaws in years. So listen to this little segment here. Minutes of your time this morning, I encourage you and prayerfully bring some clarity on a few issues that some have been concerned about. <coughs> One issue was financial transparency. That's been lobbed against me and our team. Prior to my coming here as pastor, this church had not voted on a budget in years. Prior to my coming here to the church, had never had the opportunity to view church financials. Prior to my coming here as pastor, this church had not seen a constitution or bylaws in years. No one knew where they were. I was not going to move my family to a church without clarity on theology and church leadership. So I shared the constitution and bylaws with the pastor church team that my church and loving had operated with for 10 years. In fact, when I flew out here, we had that longer meeting. I brought all that and they said, would you just walk us through that? Because in that process, I could talk to them. Look, if you want Brad Jerkovich to come to First Bocher, then this is what I'm about. Theology, you want to know it? Let's put it on the table. You want to talk about leadership? Let's talk about it. You want to talk about biblical priorities? Let's talk about it. And let's talk about it up front. And if that's not what you want, please do not call me and step me and my family to move to Bocher City. All right, so I'm going to stop it right there. Now, for those of you who are current members of First Bozier, again, we welcome everybody that's watching, listening, and commenting. So he just said, prior to Brad, and he was talking about himself in third person, um, there was no budget vote in years, no opportunity to view the financials, and the congregation hadn't seen a constitution or bylaws in years. Can anybody verify that or dispute what Brad's saying? You know, the church membership's entitled to see the financials of the church and the bylaws of the church. Um, now, I, again, I never went to first church, <clears throat> not going to go to the first church, but I find that hard to believe because, as I recall, you know, first church was a deacon-led church 
prior to Brett. I mean, I, I, how is that possible? Well, you know, we had some commentary. I can't remember if we showed it Tuesday night or if it was after the show or, or it's all been such a blur. Um, but under Dr. Fred, or not under Dr. Fred, we had some commentary that Brad th pretty much kind of threw Dr. Fred under the bus. And I thought, surely not. I mean, that's just blatantly obvious. But based on what he just said, he was literally just throwing Dr. Fred under the bus. I mean, it, boy, it sure sounded like it. I mean, that's the way it sounded to me. I don't go, I don't go there. I, right. I hate to say I'm unbiased, but boy, that's what it sounded like. Yeah, and we've got some commentary here. Um, Grady Davis says, under Dr. Fred, we did that annually with a paper statement and a vote. So we've got one dispute here of what um, Vlad was saying. And uh, here's Jeff. Jeff's watching again tonight. Glad to see you back watching again, Jeff. Sorry, it's under this pretense. But Jeff says that that was false. So, again, disputing what Brad is saying. Uh, Trisha here says um, he throws everyone under the bus and then runs them over. I, you wouldn't think that would be true, but based on what we know, it seems likely. And Barry Butler says that he sounds very angry. Okay. So I'm going to jump ahead to about 11.52. I, I could keep playing that through, but I'm going to jump us ahead a little bit. And in this one, he talks about the church has voted on the budget on Sunday mornings and the opportunity to come to open budget meetings and mentions transparency again. Uh, Jeff says, so I'm switching back here for a second. Jeff says he also removed Fred from the building. I mean, why would he remove the former pastor removed? from the building? I mean, didn't didn't Pastor Fred like usher this guy in? How? I mean, that didn't make any sense. Well, I, I heard I mean, that. I, I actually heard that from more than one source since Tuesday. I I heard it too, and, and I'll tell you, you know, when I first met Fast, Pastor Fred, I I thought maybe he was arrogant. You know, I'll t I'll tell you the exact story. I'll tell you the exact story. So do y'all remember Ryan's now it's uh now it's Kobe's, but I yeah. think it was Ryan's back. Yeah, then. the restaurant. Yeah. And Dr. Yeah, Dr. Fred was in there and he was eating lunch with his family. And and you know, I literally I had watched him the previous Sunday. I, I literally watched his sermon. And I gotta tell you, it moved me. It was really good. And by chance, I just happened to be in Ryan's the same day he was there. And I went up. And I went up to him and I said, hey, I said, Dr. Fred, I just wanted to tell you, I really enjoyed your sermon. I thought it was really good. And he was kind of, um, I'll just tell you, I'll, I'll use the term cold. He was cold to it. Hmm. And I kind of took that wrong. I, I, I mean, at the time I thought, man, he sure is arrogant guy. He didn't even... You know, he didn't even say thank you. He was just kind of like, yeah, okay, well, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm always that good. Blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of the way I walked away and took it. Well, after that, I got to talking to people, and people were like, well, he's really kind of a shy guy, and he's he's kind of weird he, <laughs> like that, you know, that right. that he he gives these great sermons. He He's this intellect, and and he comes across this way, but that's not the way that he is. It's not the way that he means to come across. So, so then after that, I kind of looked looked at it through that prism, and I got it. I I, I got it, you know. All right. And now you see that you get Brad comes along. I can see that a guy like Doctor Fred did everything he could to get this guy in and to make it be able to work. I think primarily because maybe he cared about his church. And then for Brad, are you telling me Brad like banned him from the church or? That's what they're saying. Like, Literally saying ushered him out. Let me go find this comment. And thanks for that uh, comment from uh, Lynette Savage that said Dr. Fred is an introvert, which is hard to believe. I know a lot of people that are good public speakers or pastors or whatever they may be. A lot of folks are actually introverts. Uh, as well, so it's not too hard to believe. Um, let's see, Shauna Dyer, uh, Dyer says he ushered him out. 
uh, talking about Brad ushering out Dr. Fred. That's we need to look you, more into that. We do, but but you know when when they're special special people, they 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 have these kind of weird things and being able to recognize special obviously Dr. Fred was a special person and you're going to usher him out? You're going to push him out? Yeah, that uh, that would be interesting to know what the whole context of that was. To me, there's no excuse for it, but, uh, you know, um, uh, Miss uh, Lynette Crane says, Pastor Fred is a very humble, loving, and compassionate. He is a quiet man, and that's, I, I don't know, Pastor Fred, I think I heard one sermon of his, but from what everybody said, that goes right along with it. Okay. So let's jump ahead. Uh, let's see, I think I got this queued up about the church, the current congregation has voted on budgets. And let's see what kind of feedback we get with that. And again, we appreciate everybody watching. We're at 177 people watching. Go ahead and comment if you want, whether you agree with us or not. Of course, we might put it on the screen. Uh, anyway, so here we go. Let's listen to a, a, another few seconds of this. From the first year I came as pastor, this church has approved a budget in November. The church, on a Sunday morning, has been presented, just like many other churches do, the overall budget provided the Sunday prior to the vote, and also the church has been afforded the opportunity to come to an open budget meeting where members can come and ask questions or view a more detailed version of our church budget. That is called transparency. And we have done that from day one. We offer that meeting, and we've had, we've had several people will come to those meetings and ask questions. And in that meeting, we allow them to look at it, they so desire, what our finance team sees every month. It's like 39 pages of church finances. If you want to see how much we spent on postage in a certain ministry area, you can ask about that. If you want to know why this mission's effort is a little different this year, after I had one guy come in a couple weeks ago, a church member, he came into our office, set it up, looked at our financials, asked questions. And he said, Pastor Brad, why are we not giving as much to this church planning partnership as that church planning partnership? Well, I think something along those lines, and I said, well, we would decrease it because every church planning partnership has, it's not indefinite, okay? We may partner with one church plant for a year just to get them going, or one for three years, or whatever. All right, so I'm going to pause it right there, folks, and looks like I uh, lost Duke there, so let me make sure that uh, we are still online here. So um, folks, y'all give me some comments. Let me know, make sure I'm still online. Uh, I think so. Uh, yes, looks like I am. So let me double check that. Yeah, we're still live. Okay, so hopefully Duke will be coming back here in a second. But again, according to Pastor Brad, um, the church has been able to vote on this budget at particular Sunday mornings, uh, and, and this has been going on basically since he's been there, and they implemented a budget, implemented the uh, uh, the bylaws and all that. So, folks, for those of you that are members of First Bossier, have you been able to review the budget? Have you been able to review the bylaws? Do you feel, those of you that you know are interested in, in double-checking and keeping up with those things, do you feel like you've been a part of that um, or not? You know, is what Brad is saying true or is he spinning a yarn here? And uh, yeah, thanks, Mom. Thanks, Bear. Uh, thanks, Miss Ann. Yeah, I'm on. But uh, Duke was having some connection issues earlier, so hopefully he'll dial back in or, or call me here in a second. Um, and anyway, so let's move forward. And I'm going to go up to about the 17 minute mark, 17 and a half minute mark here. And this is where Pastor Brad says that the church is officially or says that the church is debt free. And so this will be interesting. Again, the church's finances are not necessarily public, but here we go. This is what he says. As it is now. And I shared some of this a couple months ago, but as a reminder, our church is now officially debt free. We just finished a $24 million rebuild project under budget. Do you know what that means? Every business, every business you're building a home, you know the challenge of it? You want to know why? In our brand new front entrance, it's still yellow all around the front there. That's not the color we chose. So here's what I want to know. 
So they just got through, uh, or First Bowser just got through doing the rebuild project. He just said it was about $24 million, and that's after the fire, which is a whole other story in itself. So was all of the money donated to the church for the rebuild project to the tune of $24 million? Or was that project financed? Did the insurance cover all of that? Or do we even know? Because like Brad said, um, the church is debt-free after doing a $24 million project. And if, if the money was donated by church members or whatever organizations, that's great. If the insurance policy was able to cover that, hey, that's great too. But it's just interesting that the church is now completely debt-free, according to Brad, after doing uh, that rebuild. Okay, Jeff says insurance and PPP. Good point. I forgot about the PPP and COVID money, Jeff. So yeah. Maybe the church actually is debt-free. Good for them. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of churches are. Let's see. We've got some dialogue here. Um, this is from Penny Johnson. Penny says, I never saw any written budget to look at. Only thing he did was to mention a budget total amount, then request a vote. Again, not a member of the church. Wasn't there, so I can't say for sure. All right. So I'm going to move on up to the 24-minute mark here. And this is where um, he talks about family members as staff members and some of the issues there. Let's see, this is about 2430, somewhere right in here. Okay, here we go. So let's listen to this part of it. To be clear, family members have served on this staff team long before I became pastor here. And there have been several staff members over the years who have had a family member serve in some capacity. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a church in the area that doesn't have a family staff member on their team. It's very commonplace in church life, which is why it has felt like a personal attack on my family. And I just want to say how thankful I am for the job that John. And this is where he brings on the tears. <laughs> Just a second, folks. Bear with me. So I'm going to pause it right there for a second and just to answer some questions. Uh, Duke's connection finally, I guess, gave up the ghost. I just sent him a text. He hadn't replied back to uh, see if he's going to be able to get back in the show, but we're going to continue on. And so, you know, he, he mentioned the, the family deal and, you know, people have brought up having family members as staff members and things like that. And honestly, that is not uncommon in the church. And so he felt that that was a personal attack. And so he turned on the tears for just a minute. You can actually hear it when you boost the audio up and listen to it. Um, but then we go into the 27 minute mark and he's, he's talking about, he's just tired of the nonstop talking and gossip. So let me get up there to 2702. And we're going to get through just a, another minute or so of this, and then we'll we'll move on. So here we go. I think I'm just tired of the nonstop talking about things that are without fact, our complete suspicion of what the Bible calls gossip. I'm tired of my family being slandered. I'm tired of my leadership team being slandered. I'm tired of our staff team being slandered. I'm tired of first exposure being slandered. It has to stop. 
and I don't like confusion, and I don't like division, and I would highly encourage you to get all the facts on any issue before you make comments or decisions. I would highly encourage you to check facts before you believe or engage with something that questions this ministry on social media. Sharing suspicion is what the Bible calls gossip and slander, and Satan loves to spread all of it. Do not give it an inch. Okay, so I'm going to pause right there. So he mentions everything but some of the core problems of the church. And as Duke and I kind of, you know, started outlining Tuesday, there's a definite timeline to when this has happened. And, and we're going to come up with a, a much more easy to follow timeline with this. But it's really when politics was introduced into the church and the church was basically used to weaponize those politics. And that's when the division and, you know, the church kind of going sideways really came into being and came into play. Look, the first thing most pastors are going to do, or people who are getting caught or exposed doing certain things, they're going to blame it on Satan. I'd turn that around real easy and say that, you know, uh, this might be folks seeing what Satan is doing on the administrative side and finally having their eyes open to some of this and, you know, wanting to do the right thing and uh, change it around. And, and Allison, you're right. Is it gossip if there's proof? Um, I, I agree. It's not gossip when it's a fact. And, you know, we're all about transparency here. Brad mentions transparency, but according to a lot of members and a lot of the feedback that we've had, there is a problem with the transparency there. So hopefully Brad will hear some of this and see some of this going on, and maybe he'll want to be more transparent because he's pretty sure he's not leaving that church. And that brings me up to the next timeline point, which is at about 20 eight minutes into this audio. Let me, let me get us timed up right here. So listen to this, folks. I do believe that God called my family and I here eight years ago. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not leaving until Jesus Christ comes to So there you have it, folks. He's not leaving until... It was hard to understand the last part, but either until Jesus Christ is coming back, so until the second coming of Christ, or maybe he was saying it was hard to hear with the applause, until Jesus Christ comes down and tells him to leave. Again, I wasn't there, so I'm not sure exactly what he said. But that also plays right into the fact that um, the, the information that we've been given, that he is going to use the bylaws, if he hasn't already done so, to replace the entire board of deacons, and that will ensure that he is able to uh, stay at the church. Now, uh, Grady, you brought up a, a good point here. Let me put this comment up right here. Uh, Grady says this was 24 hours before his entire children's ministry staff left, so they didn't buy into the tears. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, that's what's been labeled the Monday Massacre at First Bossier, which is when the entire children's ministry walked out. Now again, that's a good indicator. They didn't walk out because of our Facebook Live show here or anything we've done. They walked out because of what's going on at that church and the underlying issues. Uh, let's put up another comment here. Uh, let's see. We've got one from... Um, well, this looks like an anonymous deal, but it may or may not be. Anyway, so I'll put it up here. It says the bylaws are available online. This is from Jacques. Uh, to find them, you have to do a search for the bylaws of First Baptist Bossier. Having pulled them and read them for myself, I can say the pastor has the authority to expel any member or staff at his discretion. Well, that's interesting, and uh, we're definitely going to Google those and see if we can go ahead and find them online. And if so, then we'll post them on Bossier Watch and all that just to make them easier for everybody to find. Uh, let's see, and then Julie Ferris says, and all the church members have the right to die him entry and change the locks to the admin offices. So, yeah, this could turn into a real battle. Uh, let me see if I can get Duke on the line. Let's see, he just text. Okay, Duke's connection is down. Uh, give me just a second, folks. He said his internet connection is down. 
self service. Give me just a second here, folks. So Duke's connection is down. We're gonna try to maybe get him back in. Duke, if you can actually uh, hear the show, if you can come in just straight by a cell phone, we'll try that. Uh, let's see, let me put a couple more comments up here. Uh, Terry Johnson says, uh, so staff there under Brad has been a revolving door. They're not leaving, being called to other churches to minister. Brad is either a pathetic interviewer or he is hard to work for. Good point. Uh, and then Jeff says, and remember where those bylaws originated, correct? Uh, so, again, we'll try to find those. If anybody's got a copy of them, want to save me a few minutes, email us or text us a link or whatever, or put it in the comments, and we'll be glad to do that. So... The question is, or, or it just seems to me like those bylaws were rewritten. I, I'm sure he probably had some attorneys take a look at them and maybe review those bylaws with him. And so the question would be, what law firm and which attorneys actually reviewed those bylaws when they were changed or updated or whatever transpired after Brad came uh, into being pastor there? And were those attorneys actually members of the church itself? And were they coalescing around this pastor when he came in um, to help make these changes for the good of the pastor? And then, miraculously, if you follow the timeline, the church gets heavily involved in politics at about the same time. Thank you, Julie. I see that. I'm going to put it out here in the broadcast. Um, Julie's got a link in the comments. We'll make sure and share that out on the main uh uh, Mosher Watch feed for the bylaws as of 2017. We'll assume these are the most recent. Uh, one more comment, then we'll move forward. Um, uh, Dana Beck says, after two churches, uh, Brad learned how to draft an ironclad set of bylaws to keep him in power indefinitely, or as he says, when Jesus returns. Uh, Marty Huggins says, attorney Gray Kitchens was on the search committee. That's interesting. Who else is an attorney or was at the Kitchens Law Firm? Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, so folks, that's pretty much it um, for the... Well, here's Duke. Hold on a second. Hello, Mr. Lowry. Are you back with us among the living? Well, I hope y'all have all of the world's problems solved now that I'm back. We just finished solving the world's problems. We also just found the end of the internet and the end of TikTok and Facebook as well. We're done. <laughs> well, good. That means I can go on vacation to the beach somewhere and, you know, y'all can all send me letters and tell me how it turned out. Oh, I want to, I don't know, you probably weren't able to hear the show while you were trying to sort out your connection, but I want to, we went through and, um, I played the clip where he did the tears and he's tired of the nonstop talking and that he's not leaving until Jesus Christ tells him to or till Jesus comes back, one or the other. But we had some good commentary that, uh, according to the bylaws, and we've got a link to those in our comments now that we'll post later, that uh, he can pretty much fire anybody or run any member off that he wants and that uh, guess who was part of the search committee? The search committee, really? Yes. Okay. I'll um, give you a hint. The last name is some place that you would go to cook. Some place I would go to cook. Yeah, where do most people go to cook their dinner when they come home? What area of their house do they go in? I'm going to put the comment back up. Oh, now, wait a minute. That's a law firm. That is a very popular law firm. Been around a while. It I mean, I remember Republican Parish Executive Committee meetings being held at that office. Well, I was just trying to remember what other prominent local, or he calls him, or thinks he's prominent, local constitutional Mr. Anti-Abortion Scholar is associated with the Kitchens Law Firm. Do you remember who, well, that, who that guy is? Well, I mean, that's not Richard. That's Mike. Oh, yeah. I mean, it would be. And, gee, we were just talking about Mike Tuesday night and his association Mike, with the church. Not Mike Welch. Mike Welch was a wrestler <laughs> at, at Parkway. Mike Mike was tough. I mean, me and he and I didn't wrestle each other, but he was a tough guy. Not that yeah. Mike. The other Mike that, you know, we joke around, everybody thinks he walks on water, and apparently he's going to walk on water and wait for Jesus to come down and tell Brad to leave the church. 
How you doing, Mike Welch? That's my buddy down there. I like Mike. Yeah, well, he says, I, this is Mike Welch, says, I am pretty sure one of those attorneys that worked on the bylaws is your congressman. Um, hey, a shout out from the old days. Mike Welch will remember this. You know, Joe Bergio, you know, Mike posted a reminder the other day. And a lot of folks going back in history won't remember this. But, you know, when the uh, KC-10 burned up on the flight line, you know, a really great man, Joe Bergio, uh, died in that accident out on the flight line. And uh, Joe was a mentor to like Mike, myself. He would like come out in the summer and work with the high school wrestlers, you know, out at the Barksdale gym out there and uh, help, you know, really good guy. Mike, I saw you post the other day. I appreciated it. You know, never, never forget Joe. We'll see him again another day. Anyway. Yeah. Moving along. Okay, yeah, and uh, Julie Ferris just posted again a link to First Bossier's website uh, to the, looks like the bylaws dated around 2017. So again, folks, we'll post those. They may not be the most current. Honestly, we don't know. If you know if there is a more current or revision since 2017 or whatever date these are, let us know or send us a copy via Proton Mail. And... Um, We'll be glad to do that. Ashley Lee Bullock says, sorry I'm late. I'm here now ready to deliver my snarky comments. Bring it on, Ashley. We've uh, had quite a few comments tonight, and we appreciate everybody watching. We're about to kind of start wrapping up the first church and the uh, drama there as it stands today that we know about, and we're going to move into Cedar Creek. Again, for those of you watching and some of you just joining, um, I'm going now, to take this video and audio once I get the transcription finished and, and pretty correct, and we will post this as its own video on the Bozier Watch site. Go ahead, Duke. Sorry to interrupt. Now, no, you didn't interrupt, but hey, I got to say, you know what? We like that. I mean, snarky comments. I mean, that. Right up like, our alley. Ooh, that's right up our alley. We like that kind of thing. So bring the snarky comments on. Let's let it roll. I mean, look here. We're all living and this is life. You know, I mean, let's let's roll with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, now we've had some more interesting information about the fire. Now, and I don't know, Duke, if you saw it. I think it was when your connection was hiccuping. Um, Brad did say that the church was debt free. They just did twenty some odd million dollars for the rebuild after the fire, and he said the church is debt free and then jeff commented and said well that was insurance and ppp so that it may be legit debt free i don't know and donations and tithes. well that's an interesting thing because you know i mean somebody you do you remember the anonymous thing that somebody sent to us that was saying that uh, i'm going to guess it was a hypothesis i don't know that but they were saying that you know there was a effort to get loans and that there were denials of loans because of existing debt. I mean, yeah, still could that existing debt have been paid off? Yeah, maybe so, but uh, that was what we were told. Remember that? Well, since Brad's so transparent, and, and maybe, maybe he is, we've had some contradicting commentary on that, but since he's so transparent, folks, those of you that are members, uh, review the financials, come back on the show, comment, let us know. You know, it, is the church uh, debt-free as Brad claims, or if not, and, and I'm not saying if the church has some debt load that it's a bad thing, necessarily. Um, well, how but, could they know? Well, because Brad said that they're transparent, and, and pretty much everybody has access. I'm paraphrasing a little bit and being a little facetious, but, but that's pretty much but, what he said. But they have to sign non-disclosures. If they know it, they can't say it. Uh, I guess if they sign an NDA. Yeah, but but wasn't that once part of the contention is, is that you, I mean, yeah, you can see it, but you can't say anything about it. You've got to sign an NDA. You can't talk about it. I don't know. Surely he, he says they're open to all members. Surely they're not making every member sign an NDA on the financials. That wouldn't seem suspicious at all. I mean, this is Fight Club. You know what the first rule of Fight Club is, uh, right? You don't talk about Fight Club. First rule of First Bozier. Don't talk about First Bozier or That's the financials. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So moving forward, inching forward a little bit. Um, we, I'm checking off a little deal here. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
somebody in the comments talked about the fire starting in Ray's office after Jeff had left. Yeah, you know, like we didn't know who Ray was. I mean, are they talking about Richard Ray? I mean, you know, are they talking about Richard Ray, part of, you know, the Kitchens Law Firm, you know, right. one of Mike Johnson's best friends. Is that Richard Ray? Assistant City Attorney Richard Ray? No, 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 no. That ain't who they're talking about. They're talking about this guy. And, and of course, our, you know, folks watching from First Church, y'all know who Ray that we're talking about. We didn't know. But they're talking about a guy by the name of Ray Ramey. And from what we can tell, I mean, Ray Ramey is a is a good guy. You know, nothing, nothing bad about him. Interestingly, he is said to be uh, a pastor for the state police. You know, I mean, I can remember when I was a Bozier City fireman. You know, we had a pastor who, you know, that was, uh, I mean, it wasn't like no paying job, but right. they just, they were the pastor that, you know, if any fireman needed somebody to be able to turn to, they always had somebody, right? Talking about things. Because you mm -hmm. see a lot of stuff. I right. mean, the, you don't do those jobs and you don't see a lot of stuff. So Ray Ramey is apparently the pastor for the state police. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's a, I think, if I'm understanding this correctly, he's a pastor at the Simple Church as well, too. Mm -hmm. So that's not necessarily the shocking or interesting thing that, you know, we discovered. I mean, how long has it been since our last show? 24 to 36 hours. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, but the interesting thing is, is that it said that Pastor Brad tried to stop him or prevent him from becoming the pastor for the state police. Why? That doesn't make sense. Well, it don't make sense. I mean, why would he do that? I, I don't know. I, anybody watching want to comment on that? Know anything about it? Well, I mean, and, and if he wanted to stop it, I mean, how could he stop it? I mean, right. what, what, but, but the why that, I, I, that is a paradox to me. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Ray Ramey, I don't, I don't know any of these circumstances, but if you've got a pastor or, you know, somebody within your church that could could do that, why would you not want them to do that? Well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, Judy has a good comment. She says control, and there's some truth to that. Um, you know, sometimes, what, what's that saying? Power corrupts absolutely or whatever. You know, pastors especially pastors of larger, uh, well-liked churches, well-attended ch churches, do wield a lot of power and influence. They do. Okay, folks. So we're about to move into the Cedar Creek School situation. So if you're on here for that or and have been uh, listening through the first Bozier stuff, uh, if you know some other folks that were waiting on the Cedar Creek school stuff, then you need to text them or tag them or send them a message, whatever, and let them know that uh, we're about to transition into that here in just about a minute or so. All right, so just circling back to wrap up the first church drama tonight, um, we will be I posting, well, we will be posting, uh, again, we will be posting the audio uh, as a video file on Bozier Watch once we get it completely transcribed and pretty accurate um, so that you can hear what you missed Sunday since they yanked all of that off of there. And we've got some more information being shared, so next Tuesday night we'll be doing another Bozier Watch, and we will probably have a little more information to share. And I, I think that that we would do good to close the First Church saga for this week out with the link that I sent to you oh, and yes. the words of Pastor Brad himself. Yes. And we will, from that point, move right on to Cedar Creek. I think you are correct. Let me see if I can get that queued up here. Let me make sure we've got, uh, hopefully, um, eh, let me see if we got system audio. Hold on a second. Offered by the guest. Oh, we don't have system audio yet. Uh, you're going to hate me for this one. Uh, oh. <laughs> I did an update to the software before, before we came online, and uh, apparently it didn't install the system audio. Um, hmm. Well, Let's see. Looks like we'll forgive you, and grace is the word of the day. 
<laughs> and we will move on to Cedar Creek, which yeah. there ain't a lot of grace. There ain't a lot of grace happening over there right now. Yeah, so I'll just a little bit of a, a little saving deal here. Uh, that is Mike Johnson introducing Brad Jerkovich on the House floor. And I don't know what Brad said, but I promise you we will have that audio by next Tuesday and, and we'll we'll kind of just kind of lead off of that and move into it. Okay. Uh, I didn't realize that that audio problem was going to happen this evening, but naturally, here we go. So, All tell right. me about Cedar Creek. I mean, I've been hearing, I, again, I hate to use this word, whispers and stories, but, and a lot of people probably don't even know who, who what is Cedar Creek School? Where is that? What is that? I mean, they've never heard of it. Okay, so... And I'm just going to give a quick summary of this. Um, Cedar Creek is a private school in Ruston. Um, it's been around since I think the early 70s is when it was founded. Um, you know, as the history and story goes, it was originally founded strictly to allow some white children to go to it. Since then, again, of course, it's been fully integrated, and so they have minorities. They, they have students from not only the Ruston area, but also, I believe, as far as Monroe and surrounding areas and towns uh they got i don't know six to eight hundred students and you know there was always a, a little bit of uh a uh, little bit of uh let's just say friendly competition between the creekers as we call them and everybody that went to ruston high school uh, which is the public school in ruston which you know full disclosure i graduated from. Now, I, now, I don't have now, anything against cedar creek though now you use some slang there that you know i mean halton people maybe would would relate to that but you use some slang that bozier folks might not be accustomed to you said creakers yeah that that indicates that maybe you've got some intimate knowledge of things over there honestly no i've you know used to live not far from the school and so i've been by there i've seen the school but i i never did go to cedar creek but that's just you know what we joked around at ruston high uh, instead of calling them, I think their mascot, Cedar Creek's mascot is the Cougar. Of course, uh, Rustin High's is uh, Bearcat, spelled with a C, not a K like they do in Bozier. Anyway, and so that was kind of a friendly joke. I had some friends that went to Cedar Creek and all that. So. I got you, know. you, I got you. Well, well, what do we have going on at Cedar Creek? I mean, you know, been a lot of, lot of, lot of loud noises coming out of that neck of the woods over what's going on over there and i mean let, let our listeners and viewers know what's happening yeah let me see if i can kind of summarize this um real quick so i'm going to do two things as i do this one i'm going to share my screen and number two look, all right so this is the rustin rants page um and full disclosure uh, i was one of the original admins for it fellow named and friend of mine he graduated from rustin high a couple of years after i did uh, Chris Butler is the one that started Rustin Rants. And as you can see here, they've got 20, over 24,000 members. And let me say, a large percentage of those members are very active. And Rustin Rants has been very instrumental um, in a lot of different things. You can see here that in their tag up there at the front, the Facebook group made famous on HBO. Yes, that Facebook group has been mentioned on an HBO show. They are you Rustin Rants is literally used as a news source for a lot of the news stations around Rustin and Monroe. Um, they've been involved in a lawsuit before, at least mentioned in a lawsuit, all sorts of things that they've helped open businesses, help get businesses shut down, get people fired, get people rehired, and they have an obsession with Sonic restaurants there. Um, now, so now, anyway. The subject matter that we're going to talk about is... And, and what happened at Cedar Creek, is this something that maybe people in Bossier, people that are, I guess you could say primarily our viewers, is this something that they probably ought to pay attention to? I mean, is this... Well, you know? yeah, and of course this leans more towards the Louisiana Watch side, but yes, because look, there are a lot of people that live in Bossier that are from Ruston. And so they're very familiar with Cedar Creek. Uh, there's a pretty good you know, double, triple, handful of people that are members of Rustin Rants. And I don't want this to seem like a promotion for Rustin Rants, but here's where the tie-in is. So what's what's alleged to have happened at Cedar Creek, and again, I hate using the word bullying. It's like somebody grading their nails on a chalkboard to me because I just can't stand the word. Um, 
But apparently there was a bullying incident, or allegedly, at Cedar Creek, you know, which honestly happens at pretty much every school. But this allegedly went much further than just shoving some kid or shoving his books on the ground or her books on the ground. This allegedly went into some sexual assault that was spelled out in pretty graphic detail in the civil lawsuit and by the Cedar Creek administration. They admit that the bullying incident happened. They deny and denied on their Facebook page that the sexual assault incident happened. And so that's the tie-in to Facebook and the social media. It's the power of social media. Now, are we talking about a, a, a North Carolina situation here with, what was it, the volleyball the, team? Or, or the lacrosse team? The, the lacrosse, lacrosse team, yeah. Yeah, are we talking about something similar here? Or well, we, possibly. We but We don't know yet. We don't know yet, so I, I'm just going to roll through some of these posts, but you can see like right here, this one from Bruce Dale Carter. That's a Cedar Creek post. This is a, uh, well, it starts out with Kmart and Walmart, but it's a Cedar Creek post because of talking about how innocent Rustin used to be. Um, let's see. Lady by the interstate. Uh, Cedar Creek post. Cedar Creek post. Cedar Creek post. Cedar Creek post. I mean, it's just been going on incessantly since the lawsuit was filed, I think, Friday, uh, so almost a week ago, and then became, of course, public knowledge. And it's gone so far that there was a um, going to be a protest organized or was being organized, and they were filing for a permit and all that to protest in front of Cedar Creek. People have actually protested downtown Ruston now. And Cedar Creek has since taken everything they have off of social media. Well, I got to know, are they vaccinated and are they wearing their masks? That's the first question. That's the first question, because, you know, according to Biden, you should be vaccinated even before the hurricane. It's more important than that. But all right. I mean, and, and by gosh, you got to have this mask that will stop, you know, three microns. But, you know, who cares what COVID is? 0.1 micron? Uh, so, anyway. So, yeah, okay. we digress. Okay, so let me get over here to the stuff. So I'm going to, give me just a second. Let me get organized on my notes here. All right, so I'm going to pull up the uh, lawsuit, and it, it's like 20 pages long total. Uh, I'm going to start. Holy shamoly. Hopefully yeah. you read that, huh? Yeah, actually I did. Um, all right, so here's page one. We're not going through every page of this, folks, but here's page one. Whew, this is thank uh, the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Michael and Nicole Conroy individually on behalf of their minor son, Paul. Paul is not the Conroy's son's real name because, of course, he's a minor. So a couple of the first pages are where they're substituting the uh, minor the real name for pseudonyms, you know, or fake names. In this case, they're calling the son Paul. So you'll see justice for Paul hashtags everywhere. And again, folks, I'm not going to make light of this because if an actual assault happened, then that needs to be dealt with. But one yeah. of the interesting things is, as far as we know right now, even from inside sources with the RPD, Ruston Police Department, that no assault charges have been filed yet. Granted, they're minors. One of them, I think, is actually over 18 now, one of the alleged perpetrators. So, again, there's a lot of muddy water here. But I just want you to know that this is versus Cedar Creek School. Here's all the initial filings. Cedar Creek's a nonprofit corporation, non-public school, blah, 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 and all that. Okay? All right. So let me get out of here, and let me jump down to, and it lists the other students. I forget. Somebody in the comments can correct me, but there were five, six, seven other students that were the alleged perpetrators. So I'm going to move on to basically page four. And this is where it mentions and talks about Paul Helday. Again, Paul not being the real name. That apparently took place on Thursday, May the 13th. Paul Helday was created by Paul's classmates, and they used it to designate the dreadful day they had planned for Paul. This is written by a lawyer out of Dallas who is representing the family. And interesting, the family that's filing this is not from Rustin. And that's one of the reasons that the mob, you know, with their pitchforks and torches is so up in the air is because Cedar Creek has some 
you know, a, a lot of their students, I'm not going to say all of them, because I know some folks that went to Cedar Creek and their families didn't have lots of money and, and weren't that influential. They just wanted their kids in private school. But some of the Cedar Creek students and alumni uh, do come from money and influence in Ruston. You know, Ruston has a whole lot of millionaires in it. A lot. Uh, so anyway, here we go. Um, so... Uh, Paul's classmates communicated online, you know, uh, apparently through social media or whatever, and they wanted to make sure and bully everybody to bully him, Paul, at least once. Okay. Paul was a, Paul so was a freshman. A, so they had a, they had, there was an organized effort to yes. get everybody to bully this one kid. Yeah, well, you know, go pick on him, whatever they were going to do. But here's where it gets more interesting. Um so apparently, Paul tried to hide in the bathroom, and, and that worked for a little bit, and so on and so forth, and then they finally caught up to him, put him in a headlock, dragged him into the school building, blah, blah, blah. Um, another student put him in a headlock, and then Kim Brasher, one of the teachers, finally walked on the Paul Hell Day where the incidents above were unfolding. All the students fled except for Paul. Okay. So let me see if I can get to the page here. Uh, wow. Yeah, this gets crazy. Okay, so um, Alex, one of the students, what outweighs Paul. Alex, again, fake name, weighs 240 pounds. Paul is about 100, uh, 240 pounds. Paul is about 140. And let's take a look at this sexual battery here. Um, let's see if I can get up to it. Uh, all right, two of the boys, later identified as Alex and Charlie, again, fake names, grabbed Paul without warning. Alex incapacitated Paul and pinned him down so he couldn't move, while Charlie, here we go, folks, penetrated Paul's anal cavity with an Eiffel Tower statue. Now, not to make light of this, but I almost can't say that without laughing again not because it was an apparent assault if this is true but because they used an eiffel tower statue of all things and according to this lawsuit it happened more than once you can see right here like the sexual battery they committed similar acts almost weekly from the fall fall of 2020 to the spring the sexual batteries continued through the march of 2021 uh, each time they forced the statue to penetrate his rectum so i'll, I'll i'm not trying to put this vision in your head, but I want you to remember that they were using a statue because we're going to show some video here in a minute. Okay, so this is a serious allegation, but it's a civil suit. This is not criminal. Okay, this is the parents suing Cedar Creek because it so, seems like nothing's being done by law enforcement yet. So I, I'm, my mind is like going off the rails here. I'm thinking back, okay, what is the date of all of this? Spring of 2021. Uh, is there not a criminal investigation? Is the law enforcement not in, engaged here? You're telling me all of a sudden there's this lawsuit, but you don't have law enforcement involved? So far, as far as all the Facebook detectives can determine, and folks in Rustin, including Folks in the know and insiders in Ruston, you know, I hadn't lived in Ruston in uh, a long time, 25, 30 years, um, that no, nobody's been arrested yet. No, none of the kids have been arrested yet. And so that's what's apparently prompted the civil suit is to get this out in the open. In other words, they don't want it, the parents don't want it swept under the rug. They're not from Ruston originally. And so they're not worried about you know, playing the class warfare political game, they want this out in the open. Now, I, looking to point 12 here, um, it included a group of boys, a second group of students watched the events unfold, laughed, um, two of the students used a mobile device to film or technically not film, video, the events surrounding one incident of assault and battery. And then a month later, th this is where it gets crazy. I'm reading down here number 13. It says approximately one month later, Edward and Frank gave a presentation to the French class 
and they use photos and or video of Paul's battery in their PowerPoint presentation in front of a class, the premise of which was a day in the life of Cedar Creek. And this is apparently with the teacher present. This is where it gets weird. Okay? I... Photos depicting Paul being sexually assaulted and battered were displayed and viewed by the entire class and by the French teacher, Stephanie Viator. Am I am I in the twilight zone here? I I, I what am I missing here? <laughs> I, I I don't know. So yeah, Barry Butler says has the state police been notified? We can get into the whole bullying thing and all that here in a minute. I want to try to wade through you know a little bit of this. So in total, Paul suffered at school in this manner in excess of twenty five times uh, over the twenty. 20 to 2021 school year, each act of sexual battery, and notice in parentheses, they, the lawyer keeps using the word penetration, okay, is reported to have lasted between 10 to 15 seconds. All right. Um, anyway, and so the lawsuit goes on and on. I'm not going to spend, you know, a tremendous amount of time because we're already at an hour and 45 minutes. We're doing another marathon show. Um, Terry Norris, y'all think that is the only school that that goes on in absolutely not. But what's happening is a lot of people in Ruston are defending Ruston High and saying, well, this will never happen at the public schools. Folks, I went to Ruston High. I graduated from Ruston High. It's a great school. I loved going to Ruston High. Made great grades. Loved almost all of my teachers and all that. But let me just tell you, kids do get picked on at Ruston High. Let's just get that out in the open. Now, I'm not saying they took an Eiffel tower and stuck it up some kid's rear end while I was there. Now, all right, so anyway, it goes through that suit, and honestly, at this point, we don't have much more factual information to report, except we do have, I do have a copy of the Cedar Creek video that the Cedar Creek uh, administration uh, put out. They actually posted this presentation video on YouTube. They pixeled out the kid's faces took the audio out, which would give us some more context, and they posted this on YouTube. This is supposed to be the same presentation that was presented to the class with the teacher present. So I'm going to roll this video, and um, let's just watch for just a, a minute here, and you'll, we'll see what's going on. All right, again, there is no audio to this, everybody. And, and I appreciate the 113 of you that are still watching. So... These are the kids going through here. This is apparently their presentation that they were doing for some French deal. I, I don't know what it was. Um, again, if we had the audio in this, we might have a little more context, but we're going to get to the alleged sexual assault that was presented to the class part here in about, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds. And so, of course, that's Cedar Creek, and the kids run around. Again, this video was put out by... Cedar Creek by the school itself. All right, here we go. You're not fixing to show any sexual assault. You didn't know what you were getting into tonight. Here it is, right here. This is where they do the anal penetration. One instance of it. You heard what they said in the lawsuit. They specifically mentioned this. That was it right there. Now, I guess that could be considered sexual assault by grabbing his deals. Here are the kids coming out. This is the statue that they allegedly repeatedly shoved up this boy. Now, I'm not getting too graphic on the show. I'm pretty sure that if it had happened repeatedly, like is claimed, and as many times, and the word penetration was used over and over, I'm pretty sure when that boy got home, his parents would be asking, why is he walking funny? I, I ha I'm not making a joke of this, folks, because if the boy was assaulted, it's a serious deal. All right, being picked on is one thing. Being assaulted physically or sexually is a whole different ball game. Okay, but that's supposedly what they did repeatedly to a 140-pound boy with that statue. So this is what I'm driving at: is we have a mob mentality going on, and it. I, I, 
I'm just not sure what to think about this yet. And it's like, you know, my hometown of Ruston. So I'm going to show this again. This is in slow motion. I put it in slow motion because I got sent a, a Facebook message saying, well, if you watch it really slow, you can see right here, look, he's rubbing on the top of the statue, getting it ready. I don't see him putting any lube on it, and I hate to be crass. Maybe they didn't want to. But I I've slowed this down to 25%. Now, the kid in the gray shoes here, apparently, of course, they all have their school uniforms on, shorts or whatever, uh, apparently would be Paul. And again, I've slowed this down. So this is where he's trying to get away. Uh, Gina says, sounds like the show 13 Reasons Why. That's apparently where the kids got this idea. Now, this is the actual sexual assault that is on video. This video supposedly shows that being penetrated. And look, this isn't all the video. Maybe they did. Maybe they pulled his pants down after then. But he wouldn't have been able to go into class and sit down after that. Let's be realistic, people. That's a large object that is made of metal and would literally rip skin. So, I'm going to kind of end it with that because we're bumping two hours now. Um, uh. I, I just don't know what to make of this except the fact that the mob mentality now on on Facebook is off the chart. You can't even post on there anything that we said tonight because the mob jumps in and, oh, well, you must be for sexual assault. It's straight up a Duke Lacrosse thing. Now, maybe it happened. Maybe it did. I don't know. It's a Lesden lawsuit. I'm sure something happened. Maybe the sexual assault did happen. Let me be crystal clear. But... Um, I, I don't know. Matt Varnell says if it was your daughter and it only poked her, would it be sexual assault? It very well be. And and again, Matt, that's just one, the video, su supposed video presentation. It's not the full context of it. It certainly doesn't show everything that happened over a year. But again, that's a big if there, Matt, because it wasn't a daughter. It was a boy, but it looked to me like and again, I'm not making light of it. I'm not defending Sugar Creek or any of the kids there. But it looked to me like they were horsing around with the statue, roughhousing. Maybe they shouldn't have been doing that either. I just, in that video that a lot of people are using to justify their pitchforks and torches, I don't see a sexual assault in that video. Yeah. I don't know. I, I got to tell you. I am uh, I'm blown away with this. I mean, where you're, you're telling me they popped this into a class with a teacher, yes. made a presentation with a teacher in the class. What did the teacher do? Apparently nothing. And now this is all alleged in the lawsuit. That's the supposedly again that was put out by the Cedar Creek administration. Okay, that video was. Um, we don't have copies of it with the sound or anything because nobody's released that. Uh, so, again, yeah, uh, Philip says, I will be careful the facts will come out if this happened like the accusation is deplorable. I agree with you 100%, Philip. He's, he's right. This, this he's story, right. It, the story is shocking. I mean, it, it shocks the conscious. But If true, it is shocking. If true, it is shocking. Right. Obviously, there's some something to the story because you see kids with this quote unquote Eiffel Tower in their hands. I mean, you see some activity, something going on there. So there was something to it. You know, something that we always say, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Right. 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 That's something that we, it seems like always, you know, in a lot of these stories, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. I, I don't well, know. I... And, and look, let me throw this out there too. I don't have the comments pulled up for a screenshot right now, but uh, we'll start closing out with this. Um, there were people in Rustin Rants that commented that they're guilty before being proven innocent. Literally said that. And other people had to comment in reply, go, no, that's not the way it works. You're innocent until proven guilty. The burden of proof is on the plaintiff to prove the guilt 
of the defendant. It's not the other way around. I want to remind everybody about that. I think most of our viewers are, are sharp enough to know that. And it just, it's turned into this frenzy. And, and again, that's the point of bringing it up. A, it's Louisiana stuff is about, you know, what I consider my hometown. Uh, but it's also about this mob mentality. If it happened, absolutely. Get the pitchforks and torches out and go hog wild. But until we have all the facts, People even, were even saying, well, if a lawyer put this in a lawsuit, then it must be true. Apparently, people don't know how lawyers and the law works. Just because a lawyer says something does not mean it's true, and lawyers do love to embellish. You know, that, that was the case in the Duke lacrosse thing. I mean, man, they pretty much hung all those boats before the, 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 the ink was dry on the charge. Sure. And then as it turns out, uh, you know what? Wait a minute. It wasn't exactly the way it was portrayed to be. Correct. Ashley Lee Bullock says, when I read the lawsuit, I had uh, no idea the statue was that large. I was thinking it was like a small souvenir desktop statue, not this huge thing. Again, that's what I thought, too, when I first read it, Ashley. The, uh, there was a smaller statue shown on, I think it was the French teacher's desk, that was a smaller version of it. And maybe that one was the one that was used, but those students would have had to remove that from the teacher's desk 25 times, according to the lawsuit, without question, and use that. Maybe they did. What I'm going by is the video that was released that is supposed to be the presentation. It may not be. Maybe Cedar Creek's lying. No. Um, this is just wanna... insane. It is insane. I don't want to take away from the subject, but real quick, Ashley Bullock, why do you have your uh uh icon there with the Shreveport Fire Department and and the bar across it. Why why? Yeah, did something happen with a fireman over there or something? Yep. So I, I guess that's going to continue to rage. Is there a date that there's going to be a hearing on this case and we'll no, know kind of what's it, going on? The lawsuit was apparently just filed Friday, so I as far as I know and I hadn't been, you know, following the actual lawsuits that close just you know what folks and some of the news actual news media excuse me posting um so we'll see but as of right now as far as i know the answer is no so cedar creek's a private school i mean you know we hear stories coming out of public school all the time but you know what the reality is, is i mean uh, things like this are going to come up everywhere whether it be public school private school i mean it's not it's not, uh, you know, just a public school thing. I mean, obviously, this is something that happens in private schools as well. Yeah, it does. And, and Ashley commented and said her ex, her daughter's dad, was Shreveport Fire Department, passed away June 7th. Sorry to hear that, Ashley. Um, condolences to y'all. So I, I just want to throw this one lesson out. Um, I hate to use the word bullying again. Being picked on is actually relatively commonplace. We're never going to stop it. It's part of being a teenager and hormones changing. It, it, you know, they're going to buck up against each other and, and do all of that, okay? Look, I don't my, know. My, to, I, my, I, daughter, I, my daughter today was complaining about girls that are in her class that they are just mean and snotty and, and being mean. Well... You know, she, it's it, it is a part of coming up. I mean, I can remember when I was in school, there was people who were they were jerks. Yeah, we I bounced between Monroe, Haynesville, and Ruston. And when I I lived in Haynesville, went to elementary school there. I'll keep this kind of short. We moved to Monroe for a couple of years, and I went to Lee Junior High School in Monroe. And, and look, you know. Don't want to sound racist or anything like that, but when I got to Lee Junior High School, I was much smaller than I am now, and I'm not very big right now. I was in gifted and talented, carried a big stack of books around, little bitty white kid with, in a school that was majority minority. It was a great school, loved the teachers there, and so I got picked on frequently. And one day, I was walking between the buildings, had a big stack of books in my hand, and they were heavy, and this kid comes up there, and the kid was actually smaller than me, and I was little. Uh, he knocks the books out of my hand. I finally decided at that point I had had enough, and so I picked up this thick English lit book and proceeded to beat the hell out of him with that book. Of course, we went straight down to the principal's office, 
And the principal gave us a choice. You get licks or you go home. Well, I was a straight-A student. Ain't no way I'm going home. So we got the licks. And this other kid, his name was Peanut. I honestly can't remember his real name. He broke down in tears. Didn't want to get paddled because he, you know, Coach Pruitt pulled out the sure enough wooden paddle, the whole nine yards, and, and he didn't back off any. The interesting thing was, after that, Peanut and I became very good friends, and all of his friends became my friends, and everything was fine. Now, the point of that is, when, you know, we've got three boys, and we always raise them that, look, don't ever start a fight or pick on somebody, because otherwise, when you get home, it's going to be worse. But do not let anybody pick on somebody that's weaker, and always defend yourself. Try to walk away, but always defend yourself, and Gene and I will always have the backs of our kids in those incidents. And it happened in public school. And we had to go down to the teacher's office, or the principal's office, with the school psychiatrist and the whole deal, and our boys did not get suspended either time because they didn't start it. So I'm not telling you to tell your kids to go out and fight everybody or whatever. What I'm telling you is teach your children to actually stand up for themselves, and the bullying will stop at some point. It may take two or three rear-end whoopings from a bully or whatever the scenario is, but, and I know there's a zero-tolerance policy and all that crap, but teach your kids to stand up for themselves. Teach them to do the right thing. All right, so anyway, I'm off my soapbox. I think that is the word of the night, and I think on that note, we should close. I mean, I think that is the best advice that we could probably give everybody. If everybody would take that initiative to make their kids stand up for themselves. I mean, the world probably would be a better place. Yeah. And Matt says, not all kids can final thought. You're correct, Matt, which again is why I taught my kids. If somebody is being picked on, that is weaker than the aggressor and you feel the need to go step in for them. I'll always have your back. If you get kicked out of school, fine. We'll homeschool. Teach your kids to defend others and do the right thing. And defend themselves. That's that's like Matt. Matt will acknowledge he's a weird bird, and he would say, we're weird birds. And you know what? We got his back. <laughs> yeah, we do. All right. We <laughs> we're out of here. Good show. Hey, we're still at 99 people at two hours. This is, I think, the longest show we've done. That's awesome. We appreciate all of y'all watching. If you got some more commentary, keep right on comment. We'll try to answer them if we can. And if you got any other ideas, Go make a free Proton Mail account. Send us an email, Watch at protonmail.com. We do look into all that stuff if you need to keep it anonymous, so on and so forth. We'll be back Tuesday night. And, and help us by inviting friends to like Bozier Watch or Louisiana Watch. Either help one. Us. Yeah, either one. Help us. If you just take that little bit of initiative and go and invite your friends to like our page, It'll go a long way to help us. Look, we're not in this to make money. We're not in this to retire from this. In fact, we don't really make anything doing this. We're doing this just trying to help our state, help our community, and to help all of our lives a whole lot better. That's all. That's what this is about. Well stated, Mr. Lowry, as usual. Good night, my friend. Good night. See you all later, folks. Thanks for watching.